And we're live. Welcome to the Catfish and Crappie Podcast. How are you doing? My name is Mark, and tonight's guest is Lyle Stokes. How are you doing, Lyle? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Hello, everybody. I'll wave, too. Uh, real quick, I am in Ohio, if you're watching this. I set this up as a premiere, so all the good people at Catfish family will be able to chat. I'm going to try my best to be in the, prem in the actual premiere in the chat. I think I can, uh, but the place I am staying at has limited internet connection, so doing the live stream from there would be difficult, and getting good audio for the podcast would be difficult. If you're listening to this uh, on a podcast, I also want to remind you that this is a YouTube channel and we usually do this every monday night at mp 8 p.m central standard time on the catfish and crappie channel all the links will be in the description including my guests lyle stokes uh who is going to be a great resource for the show guys i'm really looking forward to talking with lyle like i always do so lyle how you doing sir i'm not too bad for an old guy uh, I wouldn't call you that. I'd call you seasoned. How's that sound, buddy? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm getting seasoned too, man. I'm getting grayer and grayer with each day. Yeah, I know how that is. <laughs> but I appreciate you coming on and doing this with me. Uh, uh, and I know that uh, you being such a great resource that people are going to walk away with, with more knowledge than they had when they started watching this. So oh, I hope so. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, um, your experience in the tournament world? Let, let's give them a little, uh, for the people that don't normally watch the show or watch Catfish Weekly, let's give them a little a bit of your background. Well, we started fishing tournaments um, probably 25 or 30 years ago. I fished with my kids a lot. Uh, when guys complained about, about needing a third person in a boat because they was taking a kid, well, my kid... 10, 12 years old, that was my partner. Uh, and I fished with a guy named Keith Atkins, which was a huge um, help to me in tournament stuff back in those days. And um, we fished uh, a lot of local tournaments, and then we fished a lot of um, uh, U.S. cat tournaments in those days. And at that time, they was the biggest thing going. Uh, and they was trying to be all over the place, but the that was one of the issues they had. They had no contact information and they go somewhere. And the more they done them, the worse it become. And it got to the point to where, to where um, they would be 45 minutes or an hour late showing up and they'd set them up on the same ramp as a bass tournament. So we was all fighting for parking spaces. It just become, become terrible. And about the time that they become really bad, some of the local tournaments was getting bigger and bigger. So we'd travel to those. And then uh, the next thing you know, some of the uh, Cabela's come in and some of those guys, uh, and they was all better than anything going today. I mean, these guys that today, they don't have a clue. But, uh, you know, that was one of the things that, that I really enjoyed uh, fishing with family. When Cindy started fishing tournaments, it was, uh, you know, there was only two or three women involved in tournament. Janet Fox and Lynn Lang and Cindy and and uh, Vicky Mathena was about it in the women's stuff. But it become easier. She liked to fish and it become easier for me to get to go. The kids was grown. You know, I was, I was running out of fishing partners and she wanted to do it. And uh, we fished a lot together. So that, that was very easy transition for me. So you've pretty much seen it all as far as the actual chase of catfish or well, the chasing of catfish, right? Yeah. If I was guessing, I would say the only person that has been in tournament fishing as long and hard as I was back in those days would have been Doc. Um, I can't think of anybody else that was doing it when him and I started doing it. And that's how we got to know each other was from the catfish one stuff. I, him, him and Lynn was fishing tournaments and Cindy and I was fishing tournaments before it was cool to do that. And uh, two man tournaments like it should have stayed. That was a mistake I made, allowing three people to a tournament is a huge mistake. Uh, but uh, you know, you live and learn by those things. Uh, the, uh, the tournaments got bigger and um, not by numbers of what you won, but by numbers of people competing. Um, in, in my mind, it never was about how much money you could make. It was about how how much you could win 
in recognition and do good, you know, and some of the bigger tournaments that we won wasn't big name tournaments. Uh, you know, we won a Jack and Jill tournament where it had to be a man and woman in a boat uh, in Canton, Missouri one year. And that probably paid the most money we ever won in a tournament. I mean, it was, it was huge in those days. Very cool. And, 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 and back in those days, what, what were, what were, what was the equipment like back in those days when it first started out? Oh, well, I always had, had good rods and stuff, but, um, we used 6,500 Abu Garcia's and uh, we still use those today. Uh, the only difference is the one we use today had line counters on and the ones that back in those days didn't, but, uh, we always had pretty good equipment. A lot of people was, was using Abu's and stuff. There wasn't a bunch of these brand X's coming on board all the time and people saying, oh, they're this and that. Um, you either had Zebco 808s and things like that, or you had Abu Garcia stuff. It, it's or, or big pin, pin stuff. Pin stuff has always been around. Yeah, it's come, a, it's come a long way, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. So how did you get involved in building rods? Um, back in the 1980s, um, I was service manager at a five division GM garage. And, um, my brother-in-law, Tom and I used to go to Bennett Springs, which is a big trout hatchery in Southwest Missouri. And we go down there and we become very good at catching, uh, trout, the big trout on, uh, when nobody else could catch them. We just walked up and down. Bennett Springs and we'd find them laying up against the bank and we'd cast above them and float bait in their mouth and wait for them to, to shut their mouth and then we'd light them up and turn them loose. Uh, but I wanted to do it with a fly rod. So I went to a guy by the name of Charlie Redding and told him, I said, hey, I want to, want you to build me a fly rod. He told me how much it was. And I liked the dyed. And, <laughs> um, you know, in those days, in the early 80s, it was uh, $750 for the fly wow. rod I wanted, which was a lot of money. That's probably and, like twenty five hundred dollars in today's money. I'm guessing. Probably so. I, I'm guessing. I still have that rod today. It hadn't hardly ever been used. Um, but he he had an old Camaro, and the motor's bad, the transmission's bad. So I bought, I rebuilt the motor and transmission in his car, and he built me a fly rod. Um, about a month after that, uh, the thing jumped out of gear, sitting still, and went down a hill and hit a tree. Told his car, I still got the fly rod. <laughs> you, you you walked away with the better part of that yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, very cool so basically you were steelhead fishing for trout right we was fishing for trout and uh, i went in one day and i told charlie i said hey i've got a bass tournament that i want to fish coming up will you build me a uh, a bass rod he said man there ain't no way he said i like to never got yours done he said i'm a year maybe two behind doing rods and he said i'll get all the stuff and i'll tell you how to do it and you can and you can build it. And when I got done with it, I took it down and he said, yeah, that's really nice. He said, you done good. And he said, you're natural at it. And that's how it started. And you've been doing it pretty much ever since. I don't know. Since I know 1984. Yeah. I built a fly rod right after that and give it to my brother. It's in a gun case and never has been out. So, well, yeah, but you know, the, the equipment like that, they become heirlooms and stuff. They remind you of the people who gave them to you and handed it right. down to you and stuff. And that, yeah, I mean, I still have equipment that I don't dare touch. I mean, I have my grandfather's um, uh, actual um, uh, stringer that he would string up the fish he'd take home for Christmas dinner. I still have that and I don't dare cool. use it because I don't want to lose it, stuff like that. Right. Uh, a couple of old junk, junk reels. I mean, stuff that you wouldn't give 25 cents for at a garage sale, but you know, they're, they're dear, near and dear to my heart. So I can definitely understand holding on to stuff like that. Yep. Definitely. All right. So, um, uh, so you started building rods for yourself. How did that turn into building rods for other people? Well, you know, we'd be out at different places, whether it be in a trout park or, or if we was just fishing out the boat or whatever. And, and guys say, where'd you get that? And I tell them my building. I said, well, will you build me one? And when we got into fishing the catfish tournament, I was building rods for myself and the kids and Cindy and stuff. And, as soon as we went to the first big tournament, someone actually seen one and held it. Um, you know, they wanted they wanted to order them right off the bat, and uh, that's how all that took off. You just uh, 
they just had to have them for some reason and and uh, kept me busy as a hobby and pretty soon it got to be more than a hobby and uh, at one time a few years ago i was a hundred rods behind all the time and we couldn't do anything couldn't go anywhere because you felt guilty about leaving because you couldn't do them fast enough to uh, to make everybody happy and i was getting phone calls after that's it i'm it, it's ceasing to be fun and when it stops being fun doesn't matter what it is i usually quit doing it or slowly slow down on it yeah when something turns into too mm. much work i mean work is all right but when something turns into too much work it kind of puts a damper on on the whole and that's deal. correct yeah that is correct that's understandable if you can carp carpent Cartman Town, whatever. <laughs> if you can keep it separate from from your actual hobby and stuff, um, it, it, it's another thing. But that that's a hard right. thing to accomplish. I yeah, wrestle with is. stuff like that in my life, so I can appreciate where you're coming from there. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like the first types of rods you were you were actually building, not the fly rods, but the catfish rods, since this is the catfish mm -hmm. rod master class. The the first ones that we built was all just like everything else, and guys tell you even nowadays that they're made out of one thing. And once they come in for repairs, you see automatically that they're feeding everybody a line of, of crap, but they mm -hmm. was all fiberglass back in those days. Uh, it doesn't matter what anybody says. They was all fiberglass. Um, a lot of them today are saying that there's something else, but they're still fiberglass, but the fiberglass, while well, there's nothing wrong with them, I was they are say. one of the great, uh, materials to ever make rod blanks out of in all facets of fishing. Mm. Uh, they are they are a quality piece. And this, the fiberglass that we have today, not the e-glass, but the fiberglass is way superior than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, they were they're, they're, they they were building Corvettes out of it for how long, right? Oh yeah, years, years. You go, you go 100 plus mile an hour in a fiberglass car. Why can't you catch a fish with it, right? That's exactly right. It's just a matter of how the fibers line up and and uh, how they bake them and uh, all the all the things they do to make them what they are. So we're uh, was seven foot six always pretty much the standard length in in catfishing? No, no, no. no in, in catfishing, it used to be eight foot, but shipping has got so high on anything over a certain length that that's what's brought us to the seven six standard mm -hmm. uh, and let's face it a seven foot six rod is easier to deal with in a boat than an eight foot one especially a, when you have multiples and a pickup truck too yeah absolutely Don't you know they, most most pickup beds you can crossways go in the bed and mm -hmm. you can fit a seven foot six rod in eight foot you can't do that uh, eight foot i can fit mine just barely but i have two eight foot rods that i use quite often i adore them but they're a pain in the butt i'm not even yeah. gonna lie yeah um it, it's six inches too long but you know for some reason that extra six inches does make a difference in in, in casting and absolutely and, and shallow shallow water um fish management i'm going to call it. it 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 does make difference at least i've felt the difference in it so. yeah six inches make a world difference in castability mm -hmm. uh and when you jump from the eight foot to the ten foot rod, you can gain. Uh, I'm going to say fifteen to twenty percent distance. I'm sure you can. Also, also, um, you can get a faster tip with a longer rod just because there's yes. more material there to to spread that out. That's so, correct. Cool. So, um, all right. So we're at the seven foot six. So how how have materials changed? All right. Well, okay. They were fiberglass. So how have the materials changed over time? One of the greatest things. Um, that ever was invented in the fishing industry was when they started marrying um, graphite into fiberglass and they called it e-glass. Um, it's just a touch heavier than fiberglass, but it's 100% lighter than pure S glass. Mm -hmm. uh, people use that for a selling point and it's very false information, but um, fiberglass and, and the rosin from the graphite makes an incredibly strong, very versatile rod. It adds just a little bit of weight, but uh, it's, it's like anything. You can break anything, but if you take care of an e-glass rod, it will last you a lifetime. They are just amazingly strong. Uh, you can, can build them to where they have um, any action or strength to them that you want, uh, and, and they're just an amazing piece. I like graphite. Uh, I like 100% graphite, 
But if you scratch a graphite blank and it ever does break, it'll break right where the scratch is at. Mm -hmm. Uh, where fiberglass and e-glass, not so bad about that. But graphite is the, the lightest. Um, and carbon, I, the carbon is going to be a great thing one day, but right now they don't have anything that is quality enough for me to put my name on. I, I do have one carbon rod that I just picked up recently without naming any names, and um, I, I haven't really put it under the test. I don't plan on using it for any larger fish. I plan on using it as an all-around, you know. Right. Now, some of, the, some of the companies that are doing smaller fish rods are having limited success with, with mm -hmm. carbon stuff right now. But they, as far as having them, um, again, it's like S-Class. They put this much in a blank, and they say, well, it's a carbon rod. Well, that's not true. Or is this much in a S compound in one? Well, it's an S class. That's not true. They don't have enough of either one in heavy rods right now. Mm -hmm. to, if you had them tested for them to even find it. Uh, and, and but it, they're using that for a selling point. Yeah, and, and it's also kind of, they use it for a selling point, I believe, and it's also kind of understandable because of the cost. They're not, it's good. Yeah. It's it's hard for somebody to sell a $150 rod, a $200 rod. Yeah. They sell them, and enthusiasts like yourself and I are willing to pay, you know, more than that even. Absolutely. You, the everyday, you know, blue collar guy that's working um, and putting food on their table, it, 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 it it's it, not, it, yeah, it's not feasible for them to do that. It's not. And, 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 and I, I'm a, pretty big i mean the rods they have out there now uh they're they're not as light they're not as fast they're they're not as deli delicate or as nimble as some of them but they work the they ones do. that have come out in the last 10 years uh maybe a little longer the the um over the counter stuff that they've come out it used to be the only way you get a quality piece was from a builder and now the stuff that's come out through all the companies that are selling online, the quality has jumped tenfold. Um, I can remember when the best rod that you could get was a catfish special ugly stick. And not that there's anything wrong with them because there's all. been a million fish caught on them. But the action on them is so terrible. And they say it's one thing and it's something else when you get it. So they just slap, slap a sticker on. Anything's made Japan's that way because they don't have any uh, restrictions over there or what they can and can't do. But the quality has come along with some of these new ones where guys like Ugly Stick and them, they had to step it up because, uh, let's face it, we've got some of the premier rods on the market today coming out of these factories, and these guys are selling them, and they're making a bunch of money off of them, uh, and they're good pieces. They, they really are. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. There's so so many good stuff. And, and you know, you talk about you mentioned the ugly stick, the catfish rod from Ugly Stick, uh, which is a good rod. It gets the stuff done. But uh, to tell you the truth, I don't I don't know very many people who haven't started with that rod and kept in the sport that haven't progressed in in their needs or or or, or looking for you know that that performance increase. In, in in at least the rod and and let's face it i mean um we we can talk reels all day right yep. but when when you come down to brass tacks it's the rod that's where you're getting yeah. the leverage on the fight that's that's where you're pulling the fish off the flathead off the bottom the the blues out of you know 60 feet of water 40 feet of water you'll have to forgive me i'm not a blue cat fisherman yep. yet that might change soon <laughs> <laughs> well here's the thing if if you go through um a lineup in a tournament, say there's a hundred boats in that tournament, I'm going to bet a high percentage of those boat anglers have an ugly stick or two in their boat for backups in case something happens to one because they've had it for 30 years. It's never failed them and they know to take it because it'll always be there when they need it. Now you know what you had mentioned. You, mentioning that it, it brings. I, I've been thinking about that for a while because I've seen a couple of live streams where lately, actually, in the last couple of months, where they've broken ugly sticks that were twenty to thirty years old. Mm -hmm. Now, does fiberglass age like that, or is it just they high sticked it or did something? I think similar? a lot of times they high stick them and break them. Uh, okay. I really do. But in in twenty years or thirty. How many fish have they put in a boat with that? How many times have they grabbed it up high like they're not supposed to do <laughs> and jerk a fish over the side of it? 
How many how many things like that's been done to that rod? And when a rod breaks, it's not because of what you've done that time. It's something that you've done before, usually, that's done the damage. Yep, and not mentioned throwing it in the truck. Shut the door on. Shut the door on it in the car or whatever we've all yeah. been. Yeah. We've all done. Absolutely. I've lost some. I've lost some pretty high dollar rods when the uh, my rod locker, my boat door slams on the tip of it. Oh my god! Yeah, make you cry. I, I miss that Saint Croix. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> one of the that, that's one of the great companies that makes blanks and produces rods. The Saint Croix. They do. They do a pretty good job. But uh, people are again. They believe that they're better than. Uh, what a, a a builder can get, and that's again, that's it's just not. That's not true. I mean, uh, I, I I can totally agree with that. I, I know that if you're going to build a, or if someone's going to build a rod for me, um, that you're going to ask how I want and what I want and what I'm going to do with it. And, well, you've and, been through that. Yeah, and uh, when when you can match that up to what a person sees, they're going to be a heck of a lot happier. Um, and that makes you happy, I know, as a builder to see those smiling faces. Yeah, absolutely. Those- well, when, when a guy catches a 100-pound fish on something you you build him, uh, that's a huge deal for a guy. But the thing that people don't understand is when they're buying a $30 fishing rod at Walmart and they buy one for me and the blank cost $100 or more, and then I have to build it and buy all the components for it, you, you can't compete with, with a $30 rod. And it's that much better or they wouldn't be getting that price out in blanks. And one thing we got to look forward to is as catfishing continues to grow, which it is growing, that, um, you know, the more demand there is, the the easier the process is to create those blanks and stuff, the better rods mm-hmm. we're going to get, you know, mass produced. But that also means that the R&D hopefully will go into the, the custom sector as well and even make those rods better. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's where most of the R and D's done is in the custom builders. Um, mm-hmm. They'll buy stuff and try them, uh, and and get them going before they release that information. And once they do, then 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 factories are all over it because anything that I can buy for for fifty bucks, they can buy at them factories in China for ten, uh, mm-hmm. and because they'll buy hundreds of thousands of them at a time where I can't afford to do that. And, and it's produced over there, a lot of it. So they get it really reasonable down the line and they mass produce it. And uh, sometimes they cheapen the quality on it. Sometimes they don't. It just depends on the company and who's doing it. Yeah, it depends on the day of the week when you got some uh, that's, produced that's, too, so. I like buying cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much manufacturing is manufacturing or wherever you look at it. it, it I mean, it's, it's got its blessings and it has its curses. So That's fine. Um, right. You, you kind of learn to deal with it. And most companies out there that are producing rods, if you have a problem with it, you know, soon after purchase, they're going to stand behind it. I haven't come across any companies that, that aren't willing to do that as of yet. So Right. And most of them are buying them cheap enough that uh, they can do that now. Mm-hmm. They just give you another one and go on. It's not uh, it's not the same as, as for me. I send them back and... Um, and make them guys give me another blank. I mean, that's the best I can do. But I'm buying blanks with good enough quality that I can, I can uh, warranty them to the original purchaser for life. Now, if he sells it to somebody else down the line, then that I don't normally stand behind that. But uh, because you don't know what they're doing or who they are or anything mm-hmm. about it. But uh, yeah, if you if you buy a rod for me and and it goes bad for whatever reason, uh, I'll give you another. I'll build you another one. That's incentive to do it right, isn't it? It, it just the quality is just that good. I it mean, is that good? Yeah, the, the quality of the blanks that we use today are just that good. And I, I don't have. Uh, you get one or two every year or two that comes back, and, and some of them they say what's happened to them and tell you the truth, and you come more near getting this stuff done doing that. But every once in a while, I get one. Somebody will say, "Well, he just broke on a fish when I was reeled in," and you get it in, and that's not true. You can tell it's been shut in a car door, or trunk lid slammed on, or something. Mm-hmm. But you know, as long as they they come across, I'll just go ahead and fix them. I don't, yeah, I don't the- argue. But that ain't worth it to me, and. Uh, I want them to be happy. And, and yeah, it's the cost of doing business. It's better right. that guy talking to his buddies over a beer on the bank saying, hey, you know, yeah. this 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 rod, Lyle, really stands behind it. And, you know, you should right. be going out. So it pays yeah. off in the, in the long run. 
very cool. So let's talk a little bit about like the modern the 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 fishing or the catfishing rod world these days. Um, I keep hearing the word rod wars online and social media and stuff. So so basically, what I'm gathering, and I'm not really involved in it, but I know there's some companies out there that are new to the scene that are trying to. Um, you know, make their way and, and navigate the, the, the waters uh, with companies that have been out there for a long time. Like, um, what are some of the catfishing companies? You got everybody from Team Catfish. You got Whisker Seekers, obviously Shakespeare and their ugly stick line. Yeah. And then you got these guys who want a piece of the action. So they're, they're causing some, uh, um, they're, they're, they're at war with each other, apparently, trying to get a piece of the market. Um, what's your opinion on, on all of that? Well, I bought blanks or have been approached to buy blanks by the three major rod manufacturer blanks, the people that makes them in China for years, for absolute longer than most of them guys been alive. Uh, sometimes I get stuff from them. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes they'll send stuff to me to try when they develop something new because I'll give them an honest opinion. Not as much recently, but it used to be we'd done a lot of that for them guys. Uh, they would send me 10 blanks, and I would build a couple of them, and I'd call them up and say, man, I won't even try this. It's, I don't like it. And I'd build them and give them to people like J.D. Richardson or Chris, a uh, friend of mine, and they would try them or Keith or somebody, and they would fall in love with them. And I'd say, man, they're, they're just junk. They're not worth my time to build. And I've got some of those old ones still set out the shed, but um, other people loved them. And I'm thinking, well, am, am I doing this right or not? But uh, usually they took my opinion for what it was worth because we did build so many rods. And um, and if I didn't like it, they, they kind of put it by the wayside. But as far as the rod worlds, there are only three manufacturers, major manufacturers overseas. Uh, I've been on a first name basis with most of those guys for 30 years and they call me up and they'll say, what about this guy? What about this guy? Well, I don't know anything about him and you, know, you just need to try him and see how he's going to be. I try not to get involved with the, the financial part of it, but they're all coming from the same spot, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak. And uh, those guys have purchasing power gets them a long ways in those factories. If they're able to buy big quantities, it will amaze you at how cheap they can get them. Uh, because I know what I can buy blanks room for, and, and it's scary. And I don't use them blanks, but that's okay. If I, it's nice to know if I always want to do a cheap line, I can get them. Yeah, uh, if you're if you're looking to make like a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, a thousand rods or something like that, but that's well, not, I almost good. had a guy talk me into a few years ago to just letting them guys over there build them and put my name on them and sell them. And I uh, you just can't do that. You just can't. That's not how I do it. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have said that I built them, but they would just say manufactured for me or something. Uh, and that's just not what we do. Um, I could have probably made some money at it, but it wasn't really worth that to me uh, if we'd had a ton of them go bad, you know, uh, and may not have, I mean, they all don't go bad. They, there's a lot of people that, mm -hmm. that buy these overseas rods that get along really well with them. Uh, but the rod wars, um, uh, it's about competition in the marketplace. Main thing is, I believe. And I, like I, I say, the more, more purchasing power you have, the more numbers of them you can buy, the cheaper you can get them. And... Um, uh, that's just uh, that's just marketing. And, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with either way. I mean, there's a yeah. difference between uh, people who sell rods and people who build rods. They're two different animals. That's that's um, correct. You know, yeah. and not that the one is any worse than the other. They're just two different. They have two different goals in mind. So one of the things that always aggravated me was I see this stuff online. This guy's got the best rod ever made. Well, that's not true. And I used to tell people that I pro staff, which we don't do pro staff. Anymore. I used to don't ever say that. Never say that. Because another guy can pick that up and it's not the best rod to him. 
It might be for you, but it might not be for the guy down the road. And none of them ones that say that about production rods can possibly be true because they've never had a, a dock ski rod or somebody out mm -hmm. there that, that builds an $800 fishing rod. There's no way you can compare a factory rod to something dock ski builds. I mean, you cannot do that. That's the biggest lie and misconception in the rod building industry. But that happens all the time because they've never used anything other than production rods. They don't understand how good a really custom rod can be. And and some of these guys from Texas and California and places like that now, um, they spend more time doing weaving and things like that than it takes to build 10 rods for a factory job. You know, mm -hmm. just a huge difference. Yeah, it's a difference between, you know, like a core. Well, I don't want to bring a, the name core, but it's a difference between a Camaro and a Ferrari. How about that? Yeah, it really is. I mean, the Ferrari is going to break and cost a lot more to fix, but it's a heck of a funner it's ride. A lot of fun. <laughs> it sure is, right? <laughs> All right, so let's get into some of the, I know we're calling this uh, podcast the master class. So let's get into, uh, um, let's get into some of the, the, uh, the basics, different rods and different uses and stuff. Okay. All right. So we're back. Sorry about that, folks. Sorry for the short break. Um, so let's talk about the bank fishermen. What are their options in rods? Well, most bank fishermen want longer rods than what most guys in a boat want. Um, most of them will want a minimum of eight foot. A lot of them like 10 foot. Some of them are like 12 and 15 foot, which I find uh, ridiculous. They can't, they, I've cast them all and uh, used um, deals to check and see how far they cast. And mm -hmm. they do cast a little further, but not enough distance further with a 15 foot rod to make that uh, unhandy damn thing put in my truck and me pack it around yep. for them. You, you, don't know, just, you don't want a rod like that in a boat no, or in a truck or whatever. Absolutely not. I mean, I don't I, our friend, yeah. Avid Fisherman, he he loves those long rods, and yep. he's able to whip them around, but they hang out the back of his little Ford Ranger quite a bit, Avid, <laughs> yeah. and they work for him, and he gets around with them, but that's more, more rods just, than I want um, to deal with. I'm not, I know guys that use them in boats, but I can't justify the uncomfortability of it. They're just, they're just horrible to, to haul around stuff, and I know Avid loves his, and there's other guys, too. But I'm not going to, even if I'm on the bank, I'm not going to have one. Uh, eight, yeah. eight, maybe a 10 is as long as I'm going to do. Right. I got a couple of 10s that I use in certain situations, and I don't use them very often. But it's all what you're confident with and, and what you want to use. And, and if you need the distance, you're there. And I just want to remind everybody, whether you're watching or listening, these are catfish applications. If you're a <laughs> surf fisherman, you need a 12 to 15 foot rod just because you, you got to get out that far. That's right. You know, so they, they work well. I have a couple of whips from a company that, that work pretty well whenever I go to like the power plant right. lakes or something. And I got I got to get that that bait out as far as i can but i to tell you the truth i personally would rather not have to use a rod that long so yeah yeah and one of the, i get guys all the time getting me want me to build uh 12 and 14 foot crappie rods well the cost of a crappie blank that's 14 foot long you can go to the store and buy four or five of them for what that blank cost me and then i gotta build it uh because i'm not going to buy those cheap blanks and um it's nothing for a 14 foot crappie blank to cost me three or four hundred dollars. And I and people just can't afford that. And I'm not gonna waste I'm not gonna spend that much money buying them myself. So. And shipping them ain't no fun and multi-piece rods. Right. Some people don't mind them, some people, you know, it won't be caught dead using them. Right. You know, stuff like that. It it all goes back to what you're confident with and, and what you enjoy using. That's makes, right. It makes your it makes the day a lot better. And 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 I do want to take a step back and say, all right, we're talking about like bank rods. Whether you're on a bank or a boat, most catfish rods are going to sit in a rod holder, right? Mm -hmm. Lyle, would you agree? That's correct. So um, fiberglass will work. If you're carrying, mm -hmm. if you're in a state where you can use multiple rods and you're carrying six rods, you know, a quarter mile, a half mile uh, down a path or, or, or bushwhacking with it, it's it's going to be a problem. If you're fishing to what, 10 feet from your truck, it's not so much a problem. So things like that, I, you know, would, would take into consideration when I'm looking at bank poles as yep. well. Um, 
your distance i mean i the waters i fish i don't need to cast that far except at like the power plant lakes which i hardly ever go to so seven and a half and eight foot rod works well for me um so if you you can do that and some people are better at casting than others you know take the brakes off your reel and, and let her rip you yeah. know if you're 20 sometimes 20 20 yards isn't all that big a difference so uh, use whatever um whatever you're comfortable with and those longer rods are always multi-piece too that's something yeah. people should take into consideration right absolutely and uh, you know there's just one more thing to touch on uh, i want people to remember that uh, fiberglass quality has come way up and and i think we touched on this a while ago but i'm not sure that we've made the point it, don't be afraid of a fiberglass rod right now because a lot of the rods that you buy say they're something else in reality, they are fiberglass. The quality of them has got that good that they can get away with that. You know, being an ice fisherman, a lot of the rods that I use are fiberglass. Absolutely. And they hold up to sub-zero temperatures. They get beat on. They get frozen. And they're always springing back. You're, you're catching so forgiving. So forgiving. You're catching a big fish on a 38-inch rod. There's no reason why a 7.5-footer wouldn't treat you the same if not That's better. Right. So. That's right. So let's not discount fiberglass at all if you're buying them. Let's not dis you know discount you know the ugly sticks out there, and, and and other rods. So I mean we keep I keep bringing up that name brand and not not any of the other ones because they've just been around so much longer and yeah, it's a and good people comparison. done so much with them. Mm hmm and and rightfully so i mean they've done it they've 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 made their money but they've also helped you know they've helped the catfish guys a lot over the years oh yeah, oh, yeah. they've given us an option and, and a decent option so you know uh, like, like i said before you're you're looking for the enthusiast level once you go beyond that and i have no problem with that how about you Lyle? right that's exactly right all right let's get let's get down to, to uh the types of rods you want to use in a boat. What what do, what do you think's good recommendations to look for in boat rods? Um, one of the things that have always aggravated me, whether it be hooks or fishing rods, there is no standard for a medium or medium heavy or heavy or whatever. There's no standard that all companies have to go by. Just like one company's eight out hook is the size of a seven in another and in a 10 in another company. There's no standard for those and there should be. Um, but with rod blanks, there's not. For me, uh, the best overall all round rod that you can get is a seven and a half or an eight foot medium heavy 2040 line class, which that only is a recommendation. It has nothing to do with what you can or can't use on mm -hmm. one because a lot of that will depend on your reel. Uh, with a good tip on it and a lot of backbone. And, and the, the first third of the rod from the tip down is the action. The two thirds of it from there to the butt is the power rating. And that's how rods should always be uh, classified. They're not always done that way, but the action being a medium heavy and then a heavy or an extra heavy uh, rear section is perfect for, for boat fishing, uh, anchor fishing, boat bank fishing uh, any of that stuff yeah i like catfish, a fast for tip. big catfish yeah i absolutely like a fast tip on a rod that really helps yeah. especially when you're using circle hooks and stuff yeah um and uh, that's another rod that's most likely almost all 99 percent of the time going to sit in in a rod holder too so mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it there's the one time where they don't and those are bumping rods and we'll get into that in a minute yeah yeah. That's kind of a specialty application, it is. It is. Uh, which is really cool. Um, all right, so we got the the bank guys and the boat guys. I don't think there's anybody out there fishing out of helicopters yet. It's coming, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you you touched really quick on on the uh, the the ratings, the action, and 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 the line, how, and the line ratings. How do they come up with the line ratings? Now, this is usually for mono, right? Those line ratings don't necessarily mean mono. braid, do they? Right, no, they're all for mono. Uh, they started doing line ratings back before there was a uh, braid. So they just, as far as I know, none of them do anything as far as ratings on braid. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> so you said uh, for boats, what did you say, a 20 to a 40 pound line weight? Yeah, 20 to 40 line class. Um, 
what what does that mean? Let's say you put sixty pound mono on a forty pound max thing. How is that gonna? It's not gonna affect you at all, but it's just gonna give you more power. The, they do that because they figure that the the twenty to forty line class is gives you the best cast ability. Gotcha. So it makes their rod perform at its makes it perform at its best. Yeah. At its best. Okay, that explains a, a heck of a lot. Now, what about weight ratings? Where it says you know two to eight ounces, you know, four to 10 ounces and such. I know you use rods and you're using, what do you use on the Mississippi? You told me a couple of times. Oh, I've used 24, 36 ounces before to hold line straight down the side of a boat dead stick. And yeah, whatever it takes you to keep it straight a down. Stick with a, with a teacup hook. Kinda, on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do, how do you, man, you're dropping them straight down. You're not catching straight, that, You know, the well, you can, you can. Yeah. Uh, I've got, there's a video floating around it. Paul Ragsdale done, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago maybe, and um, a rod that I built him, which was a, a medium-heavy 2040 line class, and he cast over his clothesline 100 ounces of weights taped together. He started out with 20, uh -huh. and he just kept adding to it, and the last one he cast over the clothesline was 100 ounces, and uh, that's about all that rod wanted. But uh, he also hooked that same, yeah, he also hooked that that same rod up to a uh, lawnmower and broke a, a stake off in lawnmower. Didn't break the rod, but took off down a hill with it. So if you get a chance, you should look that up. It's quite funny. That's but, cool. If we if we can dig that up, maybe I'll add that to the description down here. If not, I apologize. Yeah, and if you're listening to the podcast, I'll try to <laughs> include that on there too. But that's it's definitely hilarious. Something. I'll try to find you the link for. But, there are, people are always like, especially down doing stuff like that on social media, showing how powerful their rods are. Yeah, I remember one guy pulling a boat with his rod. Uh, another guy just kind of hanging off the end of it. You got the yeah. gentleman on the forklift. Yeah, uh, without naming any names. Um, we were sitting at a tournament in Indiana, um, and he called me up and told me he'd done this, and he posted it online. And when I watched it, there was probably 30 people in our motel room watching it with us that day because we couldn't believe that he actually done what he said he did, and he did. And it was quite funny, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm pretty cool. I mean, the, the, the I mean, they're they're built to, they're built to lift weight. I mean, yeah. th that's the whole point. They're they're that's levers. Right. That yep. that is what a fishing pole is is a lever and and how it reacts and 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 the sensitivity. You're at least I like to think that you know you want to find that happy medium that that makes you more confident because we know fishing is ninety percent confidence, right? That's correct. That like is correct. Ten, the other ten percent helps when the fish are there, right, Lyle? Yeah, it does. It makes a <laughs> <whole> difference. <laughs> I've gotten skunked enough in my time to know oh, that. Oh yeah. All right, so let's let's touch bases on bumping rods. Explain real quick to the people at home uh, what bumping is that don't already know. Well, for people that don't know is you're tying a piece of bait and a sinker onto a, a lightweight rod, the lightest weight you can get because you're going to be doing this all day long, and you let it off the back of the boat. You have the boat pointing upstream with the trolling motor turned on, but it's going backwards down the river. And what you're trying to do is cut current speed in half or less while it goes backwards and you're just raising up and down on that sinker in the water on the bottom. And every time you raise it up, you let a little line out with your thumb and it'll scoot back a foot, six inches. And then when it's done at its very best, that's a hundred or more feet behind your boat. And every time you let off the thumb and raise it up, uh, it goes back six inches instead of a foot or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's about that time one will hit it and they're trying to take that rod away from you and you're trying to keep them from taking it away from you and the battle's on. I seen one get jerked out of Doc Lang's hand one day when we was on the Mississippi River and almost got away from him. He caught it by the knob on the back of it. That's all he caught and uh, he got it rod back in. But uh, it happens. Uh, but it is the most exciting, most fun way, one of the most productive ways that you can catch um, big catfish. But it has to be a lightweight rod or it just wears you out. Uh, the ones we build run around seven and a half ounces for the rod. Then you put your real line and stuff on it, of course. Um, but that way it just doesn't wear you down all day long doing that. And it doesn't sound like it's that much of a deal. 
But when you do it for eight hours in a yep. tournament, it's a huge deal. By the end of the day, your shoulders hurt, your arms hurt, your wrists hurt. If you, excuse me, if you fought any fish, your back's killing you. You know, it's, they hold a pencil up for eight hours and see how it starts right. to get heavy for a while. It's like anything. So that's definitely yeah. it. So, so real quick, I want to make sure everybody knows that that's the one scenario where you know your rod's not going to be sitting in uh, yeah. a rod holder. So. Uh, uh, things like split handles and stuff. Do you feel they're, they're, they're beneficial? Good. Yes, and and cork is that's one of the of the few times that I think that cork is a great grip or a rod because it's not going to be sitting in a rod holder because rod holders just destroy cork. They do, and, and I have a soft spot in my heart for cork. I just I do cork, but rod holders are not kind of cork. Yeah, they're not, and um, if if you. Uh, uh, and you can use other stuff, but you're going to gain weight on that rod. And, and the idea for a good one is to have the best blank money can buy and have uh, a, a quality uh, grip and stuff that's going to stay with you. And uh, you can get like uh, um, EVA and, and I forgot what, Hapalon, stuff like that, mm -hmm. which will last a lot longer and do you a better job for another ounce maybe on the, the build of that rod. It, it maybe will add another ounce. To some people, it's worth the extra weight. To other people, oh, no, we don't want that extra weight. And I've had guys want cord grips put on them. I've had guys that want full-length grips put on them. But when the end result is, if they're bumping, uh, they don't like it in the end result, and they order another one. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can relate to that. I, I haven't tried bumping yet. I hope to very soon with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I can relate when I'm salmon fishing, which I hope you would, will join me for again this year, because oh, yeah. I actually time my casts and retrieve to optimize how many times I present that or how many opportunities I get. And I noticed that by the end of the night, after like six or seven hours, that I'm down like 20% in an hour of how many casts I get out there. I mean, I get so bad where where I'll I'll cast for an hour, try to keep up that pace, and I'll take a five minute break, Lyle. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing, you know, you don't see a bass guy that's casting all day long using a sixteen or twenty ounce rod. They're yep. using one to weigh seven, eight, ten ounces because they're casting it all day. Let long. alone lifting what four to ten ounces off the bottom, right? That's right. Depending on where, where you're where the, the current yeah. is. Sure. Yep. And, and right. I'm just tired from casting, you know, three quarter ounce spoons. I can imagine, you know, what handling that. I mean, granted, oh. it's in the water, you're not casting as much, but it's still probably comparable work. So I can definitely but see every that. time one hits, you think, Oh man, this is the this is the best there is. Because like I say, you're you're trying to hold on that rod and you're bumping it along. And when a when a thirty pound blue hits that and he takes off on a dead run in five or six mile an hour current or more, uh, it feels like they're going to jerk that rod out of your hand. Sometimes it happens, but <laughs> you're trying to hold on to it. He's trying to take it away from you, and it's – one of the most fun ways that you can catch fish. I, I'm just sitting here listening to you talk about that. And, and for the people listening at home, I got a big smile on my face. I've never <laughs> done it. And I just want, I want to experience that. That sounds like so much fun. We, and, um, we started building bumping rods because everybody was using uh, musky rods and they kept breaking them and they kept wanting me to repair they're them. They're not cheap either. You can't repair a broken rod like that when it broke two thirds of the way up mm -hmm. on there and without changing the action dramatically. So that I was the first person to come up with a, with a catfish specific bumping rod. And we had guys that helped me and we worked for three years to come up with one that would stick with it. And I finally found a company that would build the blanks for me like I wanted, and they're still building them for me today, um, and they just work. And we've had over 100-pound fish caught on them in tournaments, bumping, uh, and the blanks themselves are awesome. And I just I, realized something now. What's the name of the rods that you build? Pro Drifts. No, the, your actual Black company. Horse rods. Black Horse Customs, yeah. right? Yeah. I wanted to make sure I got that out. I'll add that in the description. Can I add a link to your uh, Facebook page? I know you're not really doing yeah. those these days, yeah. but yeah, I'm not give... promoting anything. There hasn't been a there hasn't, but there's lots of pictures, lots cool. of pictures. This way, people I haven't, take a look uh, at your work. I haven't uh, promoted rod building for over four years, just because I got so busy I couldn't keep up, 
and I got tired of people being mad. And uh, if you can't wait for me to do one, then don't ask me to do one. You need to find the right customers. I do want to remind people that Catfish Weekly on, on YouTube had reached 5,000 subscribers. Congratulations again, Lyle. That is correct. Uh, Thank you so much. And, and aren't you going to give away a rod for that? We are going to give away a rod for that. And probably Monday night, uh, we are going to talk about how we're going to go about that because I was under the impression that you could go back to your YouTube account and get all the subscribers that you have and pull their names up, and you cannot do that. Well, if somebody has their uh, subs uh, their account set to private, that's when you can't do that. That's right. You, you can't can see get a lot of near them. all of them. So we'll figure out how to get that done. I'll be more than happy to help yep. you. But I just came up with another idea talking to you. Maybe we can get some people over to Panfish Nation to subscribe too. Maybe at a 1,000 subs, you should give away a Panfish Nation rod. Maybe we give away a Dockery Mad Fisherman rod. There you go. That'll be perfect. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. We can give the Krampus Kane the Dockery edition. We can yeah. give those away. I actually have some of those mad fisherman decals. <laughs> Angry fisherman. That's Angry fisherman. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and for the people listening at home, James Dockery is a dear friend of the show, a dear friend of mine and, and Lyle's. Absolutely. And, and uh, uh, we always give each other the business, and, and we, we come up with this phony ice fishing rod company. Not phony. It's coming to life. We're going to make it happen for a while to make us some ice fishing rods. We call them Krampus Canes. I've got so, the blanks. So Lyle's started making some panfish rods, too, so maybe I can talk him into giving one of those away when he gets the 1,000 subscribers. That'd so, be great, yeah. Go over to Panfish Nation on YouTube. Uh, check out a video or two. I help Lyle host the, the weekly show on there. We're going to add some more videos. We do jig tying on Saturday nights. Watch a video. Subscribe while you're watching a video. That'll guarantee that your subscription sticks. And hopefully you'll really, really enjoy the content because we enjoy creating it, don't we, Lyle? Yes, we do. All right, so back to bumping rods. They're usually made out of, uh, uh, um, uh, they're not carbon fiber. They're uh, No, they're graphite. Graphite, because graphite's low. We talked about split handles uh, yep. versus cork and stuff. What about the rod seats? They're usually not not the aluminum ones you see. No, uh, the that real seats likes. that I use are Fuji's, and they're trigger reel seats. And the reason is that when you're holding your hand on that reel and you're thumbing that spool to let the line out, your finger rests right on there. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a big fan of the trigger reels, but I think I'd need one for that. You definitely. do need them for bumping. And and any of the big guys that does will tell you they want them. I have had guys specifically ask for real seats that does have triggers on them, and I'll do them for them that way. But normally they're unhappy with them when they do, uh, you know, be, just because of how you got to operate the, mm -hmm. the spool and, and control everything. But any way you want them. Uh, but, yeah, they work out really well. And like I say, I was doing those. Uh, repairing all, trying to repair the musky rods. I finally said, hell with it. We're just going to build one. And we found a company that had built these blanks. They're still building for us today. And they are the premium blank. And I know companies have sent them overseas to them Japanese guys, Chinese guys, and tried to get them to copy them, but they have yet to do it uh, to the to the quality of what these guys makes them for me for. And uh, they, they are really uh, they're the premium graphite blank in the industry for that. I, I, I don't, I'll argue with anybody about that. Uh, they have 65,000 modules of graphite in them, which is an outstanding number. And to not be brittle to have that much graphite in them uh, is amazing. So uh, the guy does a really good job making them for me. And they're super, super, definitely super light. I picked up rods yeah. made out of that stuff. Yeah. So it's Seven cool. and a half ounces. Well, what, what are those rod, What are the rod seats? They're composite, the ones that you use for the bumping rods, right? Or are they carbon yet? Mine are graphite. They're gra oh, the actual seats are graphite as they're, well. Yeah, the real seats are made of they're right. graphite, which is, um, you know, everybody says they're plastic this and plastic that. That depends on the company you buy them from. Mm -hmm. um, I use the best ones Fuji offers. And the reason I use Fuji's over some of the others is a lot of the others, the nut that you tighten up to hold the reel on right. will back off or they'll break or they'll cross thread. I don't have that problem with Fuji's. And they're light. They don't weigh nothing. You know, I, have a, I have a couple of rods that aren't bumping rods, just your standard you know, catfishing rods. And you know what? The funny part is um, oh. uh, they have the aluminum reel seats and the nuts will back off, but I can't get the reel off because the, uh, the actual rear up. part of the seat is jammed up all the time. That yeah. happens pretty much yeah. so it's it's not much to worry about but it is something that'll bother you when you're casting yeah. so keep that I, mind. I quit using all them brand x real seats 
uh, 30 years ago, 20, 20, 30 years ago because of things like that. Mm -hmm. And that, like I say, even some of the aluminum reel seats that are really cheaply made, um, you'll tighten them down and they'll cross thread the bottom one because you're putting so much pressure on the top one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Pac Bay and, and a couple of brands, is, I, I stick to two major brands and even in aluminum reel seats, I don't bother with the brand X ones anymore. I wonder. Okay, now we're. Um, what about the eyes? What, what What do you What are you using for eyes? What are most companies using for eyes? What do you this, recommend? The ones that I use are triple chrome plated because stainless steel with braid and braids. What you have to use to bump. Um, the ones that I use are triple chrome plated. There's cheaper versions of the same thing, but they're not the ones that I use. I promise you. Mm -hmm. um, these the stainless will will groove. But the chrome won't. And you put three coats of chrome over top of stainless, and you've got a great product. I file each foot by hand with a file. That way the thread works its way up the foot smoothly. Mm -hmm. Smooth transition, and it looks nice when it's done. Uh, with that being said, it goes. I go through a lot of files because having three coats of, of chrome is rough. Chrome's what eats files up, not the stainless. <laughs> so uh, I had a whole box of them packed up for a guy to, for Matt to do uh, um, knives out of, and somehow they got thrown away. So now I'm starting a new collection for him. But uh, that's what that's the way I do them, and mm -hmm. uh, I can buy cheaper cheaper ones that look just like the ones I got, but they're not the same. And uh, I just use the good ones and. And like I say, I hand file them all. So it's a true, it's a really nice transition up on there. And once in a while, one's a little off of from the rest, but that's because they're hand done. Yeah. And you know what? It's something that we had talked about offline uh, just a little while ago. I have a, a rod here at home um, that I had felt some creaking in and I kind of got a little worried about. And you just informed me that that could very well just be uh, the way the, the eyes are seated. Sometimes mm -hmm. they'll slide on the blank too. So. Right. I wanted to bring that up so people at home didn't get too paranoid. So will, will a rod creak, or is that usually something else if you? Uh, usually they'll do it when they're new. And what happens is when, when people put the finish on the threads that hold, pardon me, hold the guides on, mm -hmm. that stuff, you have to bend it to take that out of there. And I try to do that on all of them. Some of them I forget, but uh, people go, oh, it's cracking and popping. Well, that's because that stuff has to. Has to get kind of settle in, right? Yeah, yeah it has to settle in. It has to get unseated from from that. And uh, uh, whenever you use a hard finish product, you're going to get some of that at some point. Okay, and that's not anything to be concerned about. If you no, it's there. nothing to worry about. That's good to know. So uh, we're coming up already on an hour. Um, is there anything else that we you want to talk about? I, I could go on for a long time. I got a ton of questions, but I like to keep them here for an hour. You know, once I start asking you questions, I'll ask you till it's daylight out. I know. Yeah, I know. we do that sometimes just us. We do, and I'm very grateful for your understanding and, and you giving me some time. So um, is there anything that you want to bring to anybody's attention as far as uh, catfishing rods go? Uh if you're going to buy a rod today, buy the best quality rod you can get, whether it's a production rod or a custom rod. It doesn't matter where you get it. Um, make an intelligent decision. There's a lot of good production rod companies out there today. Um, there's a few that's just started that I actually haven't put my hands on, so I can't give an honest opinion about them. But if you'll call me or message me, message is the best way. That way I can answer. You sure you want that to happen, Lyle? Well, I get it anyhow. So <laughs> you might as well throw it out there. I'll give you my honest opinion. If you want to know about a certain rod, I'll give you an honest opinion. If you like it, that's fine. If you don't like it, that's fine. But I'll give you my opinion. But uh, you won't hear me say anything bad too much about about the quality of any of the rods manufactured today because they've all stepped up their games. Now, as far as the finished product on how they get the thread to lay down and some of that stuff, some of that is yet to be determined. It could be a lot better. Mm -hmm. But is it going to break on you? Probably not. Most of them today have a good quality blank, a good starting point, and um, uh, most of them are, are really good. And a lot of the guys 
that you're going to deal with with these companies are really good people. They, yeah, they, absolutely. They'll help you in so many ways. Uh, and that's what separates the men from the boys, in my opinion. Now, there is a there is a company that just started producing rods that I've known the guy for years and years and years. Let's uh, give a shout out to Uncle Lou. Yeah, uh, Uncle I Lou, haven't I had his rod in my hand yet. I but, got two, but, I like beat you to it. Yeah, Lee is a great guy. Lee's a good guy. And I thank the world of him, and I, I wish him the best of luck. I, I hope he does well with his products. But you know, back when we was doing lots of giveaways and stuff, there's a lot of them other companies that donated a lot of rods and stuff for giveaways. And I have to say they was really good. And, and you get very, very few complaints about any of them ever. So the quality's jumped up a lot. Yeah, I think the best, if you're unsure and you have a limited budget, the best thing to do is get a rod in your hand that you're considering buying, whether it's your friends, whether you can go down to Cabela's or your local bait right. shop. Um, or if you're going to end up at, even at the Catfish Conference, that's probably a great place because you get to see them all there. I can't think of any other reason, any other better reason besides the people to go down there. That's right. You get to visit with. Uh, that That would be my recommendation. And it, it's buy what you like, support the people you like, because we're all kind of uh, on each other's, on, on, on your own team. Um, yep. Some people buy purely on the looks. Uh, they want to match their real color line. That's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with that. Me, I buy because I'm old and I need to be able to see the, the rod tips when it's dark out. That's one of my big things. Oh, well, you paint them white on the end or you wrap there them white on the end. Or, or, or you do like chunky and you put all sorts of glow tape on there, whatever it takes, right? Yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. I was putting, I was putting, I was trying, I tried to, to tape some uh, uh, glow sticks to them, but the, the glow sticks I got from Amazon were junk. So I might have to order some other ones. I got a couple recommendations of shorter ones. We'll try those. I've done them in uh, glow in the dark thread before. Oh, cool. They worked out really well. I've uh, done them in um, thread that was, would glow under a black light for years. We've been doing those. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff for people. But I don't fish much at night anymore. And if I do, I got enough lights on a boat that you can see mine. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, Lyle, thank you. We're, we're, we're over an hour here. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it as always. Anytime, my buddy. I consider you a dear friend and a great resources, a great resource for the catfish community in general. Um, I, I've seen, I've talked to you a lot of times. I've seen you do a lot of podcasts. And I just want to say thank you again for, for, for sharing everything you know with, with all of us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Glad to help you out, buddy. Make sure you check out the links in the description. Go to Catfish Weekly. Give him a sub. He's at 5,000. Get in there before uh, um, he goes to do the rod giveaway. Also, if you're a vet, isn't there a giveaway also at Catfish Weekly for the vets? There is on a... Uh a custom made rod rack to stand your rods up in, in your house. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Ward, the uh, mad catter made this uh, and it's going to be given away to a, pre a present day or veteran in the military. Uh, you can either be active duty or not, or retired from the military or just out of the military. Sign up on catfish weekly's uh, master page on Facebook. And uh, just all you have to do is your name and what rank you was when you was in the military or, or if you are current uh, and what branch. And that's all you have to do. Cool. We're going to put our name out Monday night. I've seen, I've seen it as this Monday night. Yes. Oh, so it'll, I'm sorry. This will air afterwards. So whoever won that, congratulations. Absolutely. <laughs> this is being recorded at first hand. So I apologize for that, but I do want to say thank you to all our vets and hopefully somebody, somebody will get, well, I've seen it in person. That thing's nice. So whoever won it that, is. congratulations. And one more thing, Panfish Nation, um, they can find you on YouTube. We'd really love the support. Uh, I know Lyle really is working his butt off trying to get that off the ground. When we get to a thousand, I'm going to talk him into making an angry fisherman rod and and I think we can get that done. No problem. Lyle, thank you again. Everybody have a good night. Sorry I wasn't here live. Um, I'm out. Hopefully I got my blue cat while this is airing. <laughs> I'll be in chat during this show. And also I'm going to have a big announcement this week about the one versus one. We got something exciting coming up. It's going to be a, a pretty cool event. So uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, watch the Catfish and Crappie Facebook page. Uh, I'll probably do a short video and throw it up on, on the YouTube channel too. So keep your eyes out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again. You guys are awesome.
Thanks for your support. Have a great night. God bless. Bye-bye.